say good morning. <laughs> we continue to struggle with the technology, but we've mobilized half the university at this point to try. I've suggested an alternative classroom in the future, but we'll see what happens. Here we are. Let's see. This is slide five, though I've only shown you four from game four. I'll show you the, the missing slide, which was in one of the earlier ones next time. The, uh, all the slides will be, are up on Blackboard. This one should be pretty easy for everybody. Okay. It's no longer a post office, but that ought to tell you what it was. You've all been, I, I'm guessing half of you have been there. Okay. Not, not, a, not a mystery. So the other, all the slides are on Blackboard. We'll, we'll review them all on Monday. Hand in your answers on Wednesday. And the grand prize will be at the last class with the prizes for all, as best we can. The post-war era we've talked about in the last couple of lectures saw the rise of labor immediately after the war put in place a reaction uh, that was national but expressed itself with particular ferocity in New York City as part of a backlash against the labor movement that was fueled by anxieties that we associate with the Cold War. Everything from the possibility of nuclear secrets being stolen or nuclear disaster to concerns demonstrating that the United States was going to be able to take a leadership role and secure itself after having been involved in two world wars. We saw how new policies were put in place that included the development of a highway system and housing policies and how New York benefited from those or at least how it helped to reshape New York. And it reshaped New York at a time when the city was also changing. There had been agricultural problems in Puerto Rico and large numbers of Puerto Ricans had begun to move into New York City. And African Americans and Afro-Caribbeans were moving into the city and increasingly with the new higher standard of living made possible by the translation or the transfer from a wartime economy to a peacetime economy with increasing production of consumer goods. Americans now take advantage of developments that have been put in place by the housing policy and by the new roads and New Yorkers, white New Yorkers in particular, are moving out of Manhattan into the burbs. And the suburbs in this case meant, as we saw, not simply within the political boundaries of New York, meaning the Queens, Brooklyn, Staten Island, but outside those political boundaries to experience a different way in which the city was imagined and understood as a metropolitan area that included northern New Jersey and Westchester and Long Island, the Levitt towns, for instance, that we associate with Long Island as a paradigmatic settlement, suburban settlement during this period. The 60s constitute yet another period in which African Americans, among others, begin to appreciate that the enormous gains that seem to be in place with this new set of consumer goods are not being shared as equally by them. And that problems of discrimination in housing, discrimination in the job market has continued. And some of the protests associated with long-standing patterns of Jim Crow in the South are now being articulated by New Yorkers as not uniquely Southern problems, but also as problems that affect New York as well. We had seen at the same time how New York City, and Manhattan in particular, it's an example of that, had increasingly become not just a dual economy, but a city that separated into ethnic conclaves, racialized ethnic conclaves, and with vast differences between rich and poor, and with different kind of even political valiances of the community. So that Wall Street would be downtown and becomes the center for a new kind of corporate America housed in New York at the same time as Greenwich Village is emerging and has emerged as a 
image across the country of a bohemian counterculture or an alternative cultural space for Americans. The New York Times this morning had an obituary for a woman whose life suggests something of the transformations and her life also tells us something about experiences that I thought would be particularly of interest to those of us here at New York University. I know her life a little bit because she's her, I, I read her oral history for a book I wrote about the history of social work uh, about a decade ago. Her name is Dorothy Haight and the Times obituary simply describes her as a quote largely unsung giant of the civil rights era. She dies at the age of 98. So I just thought I would share with you a few bits of this obituary because of the ways in which she traverses the history of New York City into the 60s and lets us see something um, of the place that even NYU plays in that story, even though it's a small place. Dorothy Irene Haight was born March 24th, 1912 in Richmond, Virginia. So her story begins, just as so many of the stories did, in the South for African Americans, though many of them had come out of the Jim Crow South at the end of the 19th century. She's part of the tail end of that kind of migration, but one that would continue right through the the 20th century. She in fact goes to a small town outside of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, or her family does, where she attends an integrated public school. She begins, we're told, her civil rights work as a teenager, volunteering on voting rights and anti-lynching campaigns. That's to say she was very much aware of the kind of atmosphere in the South that was leading African Americans to want to get out. That's, we know that the jobs weren't going to be great necessarily in the North, but on the whole, we weren't hanging people, we just weren't hiring them, and that was a whole lot better. In high school, she enters an oratory contest, I didn't know this bit, sponsored by the Elks on the subject of the United States Constitution. And she advances to the national finals where she's the only black contestant, and she wins. Okay, an entirely white jury, Again, and it's a testimony to the character of liberalism in the North and that not everybody was racist and there were open-minded people. She wins and is granted a four-year scholarship to Barnard College in New York. She comes to New York, shows up at Barnard, and is told, wonderful, we're delighted to see you. Alas, we've filled our quota of African-American students. So you can't enter. So she goes downtown and enters NYU, which quickly embraces her, and she completes her four-year education at New York University. She earns a bachelor's degree in education there in 1933, and a master's in psychology at NYU two years later. So she's one of our stellar undergraduate and graduates of the university. She becomes a caseworker in the New York City Department of Welfare in the 30s, and that's where I picked up her story and was interested in it, where she becomes the assistant executive director of the Harlem YWCA. And remember, I mentioned to you again that the YWCA was one of those pioneer institutions that was quite progressive in New York City in particular and in Harlem as helping to build a kind of, not just community base for activism in Harlem, but trying to create a kind of political activist consciousness within the African-American African community about the problems of the poor, the problems of African-Americans, and the problems of women. And she really addresses all of those kinds of questions in her role at the YWCA, where she, among other things, escorts Eleanor Roosevelt, who comes to visit the city um, during, the, during the New Deal. Um, while she's there, just to give you an example of what she does, one of her first public acts is the Y, was to call attention to the exploitation of black women working as domestic day laborers. The women who congregated on street corners in Brooklyn and the Bronx were known, local, known locally in areas as, quote, slave markets. That, by the way, is a familiar kind of notion that's used today if we go to Long Island communities where migrants from Mexico are often waiting on street corners, waiting to be picked up for day labor jobs. It's a kind of parallel institution that exists. So it hasn't one that's entirely been, been wiped out. 
So she talks, notices and draws people's attention to these slave markets where they're being hired for 15 cents an hour by white suburban housewives who cruise the corners in their cars. So today we have the, it's the white suburban husbands cruising and, and employers looking for gardeners, among other kinds of things in those kinds of areas, day work being done. She testifies before the New York City Council about the slave markets, attracts the attention of national and international news media, and it's enough to drive the markets underground, though they later reemerge. So as I've suggested to you, she doesn't destroy them, but she, she, but she draws a kind of heightened public awareness of that kind of problem. It also suggests how there were people mobilizing and becoming aware of these kinds of issues, but how there were vested interests in not eliminating these processes. People, there was cash value after all in only having to pay somebody a small amount for that kind of work. So it wasn't destroying them because while there now is a New York constituency mobilizing to change these things, there's a market that these, that's still driving the continuation of these things, even if they're underground during the same period. So they persist as, as I've suggested, they persist to this day. Uh, just to tell you a little bit later, in the, in the, she continues at the Y, where she works at the Center for Racial Justice until 1977. Um, and during the 30s, she helps institute something called Wednesdays in Mississippi, a, a program that drew interracial teams of northern women to the state to meet with black and white women there. So she was basically helping to organize the equivalent of something that were two things that resonated with people in New York and young people in the North. One was what was called Mississippi Summer, okay, in which young white people from the North were going into the South um, in order to conduct mobile, mobilize voter drives. And we'll talk about Mississippi Summer. Some of you have seen the film Mississippi Burning, the Hollywood film that's a dramatization of the murders of uh, both a black, young black man there and two white New Yorkers who had gone down there to the south during that Mississippi summer. The other thing that she's drawing upon that attracted many other people from the Northeast and, and people who were New Yorkers were, of course, Freedom Rides. And she's reflecting something of that kind of drive in which she's trying to integrate now the role of women in partnering in integrated ways with black people in the South, back, going back down there to fight for racial justice. One of the things that those of us who were freedom riders understood, and I, and I was in a small way, was also that our struggle was as much about things that existed at home in New York and not just things that were, were in the South. And that, of course, when you came back home and suggested to people in the city that there were problems of racism here, that wasn't always a message they wanted to hear. They were much more willing and supportive of the notion that there were problems of racism in the South than the suggestion that somehow or another we were implicated in that story in some way as well. Well, the origins of a 1960s social consciousness that comes out of, and at least is located often, or its center is seen as located here, Washington Square Park becomes the kind of symbolic center of that movement as much as the East Village is, as, as it's emerging as a new, it was known as the East Village until, this, until really uh, the, the mid-60s, as I told you, the real estate developers rename it the East Village, only in the mid-60s, becomes, um, has its origins in what's going on in this area in the 50s, in particular with groups of people known as the Beatniks. And I will read you a poem from perhaps the most famous of those Beatniks, Allen Ginsberg, whose poem, most famous poem was called Howl. Um, Ginsberg lived in New York, gay man, active both in uh, later and influential in the origins and beginnings of what would become the gay movement, but also was a poet um, and someone who helps to articulate and try to become a symbol of what would be seen as a kind of alternative lifestyle. He's actually from not, from, not born in New York City. He was born in an area that becomes, emerges during this period as part of the metropolitan area. He's from Patterson. I saw the best minds of my generation destroyed by madness, starving, hysterical, naked, dragging themselves through the Negro streets at dawn, looking for an angry fix. 
angel-headed hipsters burning for the ancient heavenly connection to the starry dynamo in the machinery of night, who poverty and tatters and hollow-eyed and high sat up smoking in the supernatural darkness of cold water flats floating across the tops of cities, contemplating jazz, who bared their brains to heaven under the L and saw Mohammedan angels staggering on tenement roofs illuminated, who passed through universities with radiant cool eyes hallucinating Arkansas and Blake like tragedy among the scholars of war, who were expelled from the academies, uh, academics, I'm sorry, Aca no, I'm right, right, from the academies, for crazy and publishing obscene odes on the windows of the skull, who cowered in unshaven rooms in underwear, burning their money in wastebaskets and listening to the terror through the wall, who got busted in their public beards returning through Larido with a belt of marijuana for New York, who ate fire in paint hotels or drank turpentine in Paradise Alley, death or purgated their torsos night after night with dreams, with drugs, with waking nightmares, alcohol and cock and endless balls, incomparable blind, streets of shuddering cloud and lightning in the mind, leaping toward poles of Canada and Patterson, illuminating all the motionless world of time in between. New York City, as the legacy of a Bohemian center, served as a source of leaders to meet head on the problems of race and inequality. It was an alternative to driving out of town. These people stayed. They moved from the suburbs like Patterson to New York. They are a counter movement. They are not the majority. They are a minority movement. The majority are moving out. But they are a counter voice. Think of it if you'd like as a piece of music in which the main chords are played by the violins and most of the horn instruments and there in the background you hear a tuba, boom, 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 trying to suggest there's something else going on. And that's what we're hearing, the tuba from the village. Beatniks, like Allen Ginsberg, go to places that you can still go to today, the Cafe Wa. I remember going there in the late 50s and then I looked in my um, high school reunion book, you know, your, the book you get when you're a senior and what your pages are there, and one of, the, one of my classmates has written something like, stay out of New York and don't let the beatniks get the best of you. So they all had this image. I grew up in northern New Jersey at a regional high school, and they, and they knew I went into the village as, a, as part of an acting group, and we went, and we went to these kinds of places like the Cafe Wa, and they all imagined that this was a den of iniquity. It had, on one hand, a level of fascination, but it was also, ironically, a place that, to which none of my classmates went. New York was a foreign territory, okay? 11 miles away, but they never went into New York City. They were scared to do so or thought it was a, a foreign country. Cafe Wa, the Provincetown Players. We, I think we've, NYU's just torn that place down, but for part of the law school. No, it's, um, they're not allowed to tear down the building. Oh, that's next door, right? They're encasing. They're encasing it. Thank you very much for that. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit how we're dealing with the past. We're encasing it. <laughs> Washington Square Park emerges as, the, as one foci for an alternative music and cultural scene around folk music, notably bluegrass. The freaks are destroying conditions in Washington Square Park, wrote Newbold Morris, New York City's Commissioner of Parks, in March of 1961. With that proclamation, he denied them a permit to folk sing in the park. They had been doing so after World War II, right through the 1950s. He continued, I want to emphasize I'm not opposed to the wonderful symphony concerts, to the bands or quartets of chamber music. Rather, he says, I oppose the fellows that come from miles away to display the most terrible costumes, haircuts, etc., and who play bongo drums and other weird instruments attracting a weird public. 
That's Washington Square Park. <laughs> the right to sing protest arises as a consequence of that. And a protest movement emerges in 1961 from people with the radical demand that they have a right to sing in the park and play this weird music called bluegrass. The movement was led by Alan Lomax, who's one of the pioneers in the folk dance and recording music with the Smithsonian Institution. And it's led by a young village politician who himself sang as a folk singer and played bluegrass music in the park in the 1950s. His name was Eddie Koch. He would, of course, become a mayor of New York City. But in the 50s, he was a bit of a beatnik folk singer playing in the park. They hold a mass demonstration. And it's met with police intervention. The protesters engage in a form of resistance that had become commonplace in the labor movement and in anti-war movements and in the civil rights, I'm sorry, in the civil rights movement in particular, passive resistance. That's to say, learning it had become very popular and widespread internationally through the work uh, in India from, from Gandhi and others. It was simply to make, put all your, all, make, uh, all your muscles loose, lie down flat, and not resist at all, make them have to carry you, physically just carry you away, but not protest at all. So there was passive resistance. The police came in with billy clubs, and it was described in the Times as a riot, though the historic historians who have since studied this have demonstrated, have, have argued there was no evidence whatsoever that there was a riot, or if there was, it was by the, by the police. Ultimately, there's a protest, and the committee does win a reversal. And you're the beneficiaries of that today. You can go to Washington Square Park and you can listen to all that weird music and you can be one of the weird people listening to it, I suppose. Most important for me isn't the truth of the story, about which there are many truths depending on which side you were on. Rather, how the event demonstrates the wide gulf that had begun to appear in New York City and was being brought to, the, was being brought to Greenwich Village. That's to say, in the village was this counterculture, and it was something about which the authorities were aware. It was something with which the authorities wanted to deal, and they did. The event demonstrates, if you'd like, the division in the city over these alternative cultures and over Greenwich Village as a political site. Who was going to control? Space matters. Controlling space matters. It'll be a dispute, by the way, today that goes on over the gentrification of Union Square. It's been a debate many of you would have read about uh, from community boards that were protesting the privatization of the park of, of, of Union Square with a private restaurant in the back. So these kinds of struggles have gone on for a long time. During the 60s, Washington Square Park becomes a national and a city image for this counterculture. The 60s counterculture moves outside of there. It's also in the East Village. The Fillmore East is a movie house that has psychedelic music, as well as not just bluegrass and folk music, but the new kind of hip music. And the people in there, of course, are engaged in a celebration of psychedelics as a way of thinking about how one expands one's, and this was the language they would use, consciousness to not simply have the same set of ideas that had led people to racial, racial behavior, or to have the same set of ideas they believed that led people to engage in a war in Vietnam. They're arguing that one needed to get outside of the materialism that they saw as endemic to this kind of new, the language they would have used, kind of neo-colonialism of an enterprise, of an escapade into Vietnam that the French had failed at and now they saw Americans engaged in. And so they're all offering an alternative set of languages and they're suggesting that if you're going to change politics, you have to change the way people think. And so you have in the village groups of people who are political radicals and there are people who are cultural radicals. The cultural radicals will become known as hippies. There'll be people like Jerry Rubin and Abby Hoffman and they'll write books like with the title of things like, Steal This Book, because they're actually trying to argue 
One needs to counter the commercialization and the market forces that they believe have led to the kind of thinking that had led to racism and imperialism as they understood it. So you have both a counterculture and you have a political radical culture and they work it together at times and sometimes they overlap and sometimes they're somewhat distinct. The radical political culture, the radical culture was often trying to argue one needs to create an alternative radical community. So its language was one often of communitarianism. The, ra the, the radical politicos tended to gravitate from everything from mild forms of social welfare and welfare rights movements to movements that were sectarian infatuated with Maoists, with Maoism, movements that were anarchist in their nature as well. The whole range that they cut across. The majority of people were not in any of these extreme positions of the Maoists or the anarchists and they weren't all ready to go out and steal books and not everybody was ingesting mushrooms at enormous, in enormous quantities. But the movement had a widespread impact on campuses and in New York, both at Columbia and at NYU as examples. Not necessarily, again, a majority, but a large enough impact to change the social attitudes at campuses and the behavior and create social movements on these campuses. The political radicals were, in fact, based in New York so we have the Socialist Labor Party and the Communist Party, as you know, we're headquartered in New York City and in the village and outside the village as far as 23rd Street. We have Students for a Democratic Society on campuses all across the country, but notably at NYU and at Columbia University. Columbia will be associated with a very famous protest that many of you know around Mark Rudd and protest over Columbia's effort to expand into the Morningside Heights community and build a gym that was not going to be sensitive from the perspective of the, of the protesters to the needs of the Harlem community. And so they go out on strike on behalf, arguing not of themselves, but of themselves as part of a community that includes Harlem. And that was the point of their movement to argue that it isn't simply a, one has to get beyond self-interest and understand that our interest is tied to the interests of a community. And of course, the response was that Columbia calls in the police and the backbone of the strike is broken at Columbia, but with a lasting legacy. And indeed, the people who were active in that strike are now the, include uh, a provost and vice president at Columbia. But that's a different story that they'll have to tell. At NYU, it did lead to some dramatic behavior as well in radical organizations that would see a couple of one building bombed and a couple of students even expelled. But NYU on the whole, the movement was largely one that we would argue about civil liberties and civil rights. To give you an example of the transformation, NYU was, not, was different than other campuses, worth noting. It had a campus uptown. That was actually in the Bronx. It's now, um, it's now one of the, that campus is now used by the City University of New York. We sold that campus, uh, I think, around 1971, when the university had some financial, was having financial problems. Uh, the university was bailed out because the law school sold Butoni Macaroni Company and gave the money to the College of Arts and Sciences. That's another story. But in 68, there is a protest Columbia, at, here. Uh, but. What makes NYU different is it's not largely downtown, not a residential campus. It's a commuter school. But residential campuses and where you had residences, the rules in place generally were that universities operated in loco parentis. Okay. Anyone want to translate that for me? In the place of the parent. In the place of the parent. So that meant it was expected to oversee your behavior very carefully. You were not to be treated as adults. You were to be treated as children with the university as your parent. And that meant that there were things called parietals in every university in the country. Anyone know what a parietal was? It's an old institution associated with the, with the, with the olden days, meaning the early 60s, mid-60s. Anyone, anyone want to guess what a parietal would be? 
Well, quite simply, it was a rule in place in which the, some students had to be back in their dorms at a certain hour every night and had to sign in when they left and had to sign in when they were back. The students who had to do this on the whole were only, you only had to lock up one half of the student body if in fact it was co-ed. You only locked up the women. So it was only women that had parietals. Men were free to roam the streets. I think NYU never presumed that men had any interest either in, them, in, in, in each other necessarily <laughs> or, um, or, in, or, in street, or in street life. But the presumption always was that it was women who had to be protected. It's a vestige really of that earlier, that world view that we've talked about all the time about cults of true womanhood and protecting women. So young girls were locked up at every major university. There were parietals at uh, the school where my wife and I were students uh, was, was pretty much commonplace, the rule. Freshman girls had to be in by 10 o'clock every night. Uh, and uh, they had five extra hours that they could stay out on weekends, but they could not be uh, five consecutive hours on any one of those nights. And they all had to be back in their room. By s Everyone had to be in at 6 a.m. so you couldn't stay out all night. The men didn't have to be in at all, I'd say, so the men were free. So one of, the one of the ways in which the student movement mobilizes is it mobilizes against this notion of in local parentis about the university overseeing the rules. And this, as you can imagine, had widespread appeal, not just to a few students about smoking pot in the park. Okay? It suggested really uh, to students simply the ability to control their own lives. And so even though this movement doesn't absolutely affect everybody, it ultimately, or not everyone's involved in the movement, it does change very much the character of universities. At NYU, it changes in another way, to give you an example, some of you here. Um, anybody here major in Metropolitan Studies? Okay, it's an example. Um, gender and Sexuality Studies, Metropolitan Studies, Latino Studies, African American Studies, none of those existed prior to 1968, okay? Metropolitan Studies as a program is created by student protest at NYU. Urban studies programs around the country are created only after 1968 by university students demanding that if the cities are burning, if students and cities are in a state of crisis, the universities of which we are arguing we are a member, the universities are arguing that we're a member of the community, ought to be involved in those communities. And so not only did they demand that there be a program for the study of the city, they demanded that it be a program that be both in the city and of the city, that it had to have an activist component. So Metropolitan Studies was established by NYU in 1968 with a requirement that it have an internship program and that there be somebody on paid salary to oversee that program and that students get academic credit for engagement and involvement in learning from the city and working in the city. Those internships now are commonplace and required as part of the journalism program and environmental studies and metropolitan studies. And as you know, I'm the director of experiential education for the college so that we're trying to make that possible and a commitment from the university and from the dean to make that possible for students in any department in the university. The point really is to argue it comes out of the students and it comes out of this kind of movement. African American studies, which is transformed here into Africana studies, has its origins at roughly the same period of time. From the concern and awareness that African Americans need to be both at the university and need to be integrated into their history. Their history needs to be integrated into the experience of the community. And women's studies will have its origins in the next few years after this. That was not entirely the story that everyone learned. The story that everyone learned, however, about what was going on in the cities was one that was mediated by the press and it was mediated by concerns that they, by public authorities that often believed that there weren't legitimate issues but rather outside agitators often engaged in wild-eyed, destructive efforts. That in its own way we've seen as a trope that goes back to, do you remember, 1871, 1872, 1874. Remember we talked about how it played a small role very early in the, um, in the, in the riot at a park. Which other park, do you remember? 
Hmm? Tompkins Square, remember? As early as the 70s. So, that. so I thought I'd show you briefly a video, if this all works, from NYU. of NYU, inciting to riot. I'm not going to show you all of this. Inciting to riot documents the activities of transcendental students, a radical anarchist group at New York University. Much of the major anti-war demonstrations were attended by TS. As a result of political vomit, T.S. was infiltrated by an undercover agent posing as a filmmaker. Many of the scenes were filmed at Harutz, an anti-war coffee, coffee shop operated by T.S. Some scenes were recreated. That's not part of the film. You see the counterculture in the long hair? So he's the police spy, really. He's a, posing as a filmmaker. Hi, my name is Steve. I'm from Liberation Film Service. Hi, everybody. I want to ask you a few questions about TS, OK? Now, I've, I've heard TS is a bunch of really together people, but what I don't understand is why so much hostility at the door with those people. You come in with a camera and, and uh, mic and stuff, and people get really uptight. Like, we, you know, there's been a lot of a lot of heavy stuff going on around here. You know, Rip Rotsky was ripped off and the administration is uh, trying to pick out radicals and get them in the Red Squad. Finnegan, Finnegan's the guy who, you know, works for J. Edgar in New York. And uh, we've been, you know, hassling with him a lot. He takes our pictures a lot. So, you know, somebody walks in with a camera and uh, a mic, people get really uptight. You know, people can walk in and out of here. And of course, they had every reason to. This guy was walking in with a mic and was actually working for the police. So I'm sorry about that. Tell me, are you one of the leaders of TS? We don't have any leaders, but, uh, you know, everybody's a member that wants to be, but uh, I know the people, you know, that are generally. Okay, well, let me ask you a question now. I've heard a lot about TS, and I know that you're not into heavy doctrinaire bullshit like other radical groups. Could you elaborate on, on the politics of TS at all? Yeah, well, like, last year we had free gas and stuff, and I was, like, taking over the South Study Hall, which was uh, illegal in terms of the university, and just letting people uh, do their own lifestyle thing in South Study Hall, and uh, then the cops were called in to get us out of there. So it's challenging authority, but not, like, in a really heavy way. It's, like, creating free space so people can do their thing, and, uh, you know, if the cops come, the cops come, and we, like, we leave, you know, guerrilla style, and uh, go somewhere else. But, uh, you know, that kind of thing. We don't try to take people and push them anywhere. We try to create space where they can do their own thing. That's really groovy. Okay, now. <laughs> Between TS and SDS, what would you say that is? That is uh, I guess we're anarchists. Anarchists. That's good. It's right on. Really. <laughs> what I want to do, Rick, is I want to make a film about TS and about roots. That's right. A radical film. Um, and I want to know if you think that film has any relevance in, in the radical movement. Uh, yeah, it has relevance. I mean, it's, you know, it depends how you do it. I mean, some films don't, some films do. It's better than leaflets. It's better than uh, sitting around meeting all the time. That's, that's a lot of time. Yeah, you know, sure, it could be relevant. Yeah. Well, do you think we can work, us, work something out? 
Uh, well, I don't know. I couldn't say. I mean, I can talk to the people and see what they want. I mean, they're uptight, so you have to, you know, be around. I'll talk to them, but I really don't know. Okay, well, I'll talk to them myself, too. I hope we can get some of you together. Okay. Thanks a lot. Good. Good. I think that's enough. You get the idea. We'll come to those in a minute. Any questions, by the way? Just since some of you probably know by now, at least I was pretty deeply involved in a lot of these anti-war and civil rights movements of different ways and student, student activities. I don't know if there are things you want that I can tell you less as an historian, but rather as a participant observer, if there are questions that you might have about, about that period. I should at least invite you to ask such questions. You said there was a bombing of one of the NYU buildings? There was. So I think it was a math building. Yeah, can you, can you give more detail about that? Why did they? You know, I 
I have no idea other than I suspect that they thought that this was a way of stopping them, uh, that a lot, of the, uh, a lot of the departments at universities were involved in doing work for the government. So they were often involved in doing work for, um, the, for the military in different ways, under military contracts. And so a lot of the ways in which some people were trying, first some people were trying to draw attention to the fact that the universities were complicitous in the military efforts in Vietnam in different ways. They were getting funded to do it or they in fact were doing programs that, at my university there was a program that uh, the computer science program, was, uh, computer studies program department was involved in um, developing a model for how to systematically uh, hole an area that was meant to be also about systematically bombing an area. So it was for, but it was under contract to the Defense Department. So that was, so in this case they were going beyond simply drawing an awareness to it. Obviously it was, you know, one or two, there were always some hotheads at different places, not unlike the Weatherman Bomb Factory that you folks saw, um, you know, on, on 10th Street. So there always were a few people in this TS group, which is a, uh, by and large, transcendental, uh, was meant to, in fact, reflect the um, cultural radicalism rather than just political radicalism. So the Wilder and Anarchist group, Transcendental Meditation and the, trans the reference to the Transcendental Society was to suggest people that were as much involved in uh, doing their own thing and creating an alternative space, the language that they would have used. But there were always some people who were, act who were involved as well, fringe, fringe groups that were involved in thinking about political action. They, and. Uh, the person who was expelled was Richard Epstein. He works as a gas station attendant in the Oakland area. I only know this because we had a plant named Richard Epstein uh, for many years. Uh, Judy and I were studying in Grenoble, Flor in Grenoble France um, in 1965 in the summer. And there was this young guy who had just gotten a big fancy fellowship to go and work with Piaget in Switzerland and he was there studying as well and his was Richard Epstein and he was going to go and study with Piaget and then go back to the psychology department and do a PhD at NYU. And so that's how I happen to know who this person is. So I knew him from this one summer when he was in, in France. But I later learned that Richard was the person who, and he was one of the least crazy people I could, I knew certainly in the, in the mid-60s when I knew him, but I have no idea how he was transformed. But I know he was suspended from school and kicked out at NYU. I don't know how many, if there was anyone else. NYU was at Greenwich Village, if you remember, since the Songcrowders riot in 1832. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, when, cause there are a lot of protests kind of like scheduled in Washington Square Park that yes. were student based. That's right. Did, um, did they draw a lot of students into them? Like, because I feel like Columbia has more of a reputation for being politically active. So, was, did NYU students just get lost in the fact that they weren't organized by students, no. or were they not really? I don't think that NYU students were any less uh, politically active. NYU was a very different kind of place. Remember, in the uh, NYU had students who went and fought with the Abraham Lincoln Brigade um, and in the, during the, against the, in the Spanish Civil War. There were, uh, there were many students at NYU who were involved in socialist and communist party activities in the 30s and were involved in working with the labor movement. There were many students at NYU who were involved in civil rights, anti -so, you know, civil rights movement and in the anti-war movement. But NYU in the downtown campus in particular was a commuter school. And it was a school really of people who uh, did not spend their time. There wasn't a real campus community that helped to knit people together in that kind of way. Columbia was a residential campus. It creates a kind of, it makes it much easier to organize and people are much more involved in day-to-day -day lives. NYU students were busy, they held, they held jobs. They came to school part-time in large numbers. The, the equivalent place would have been the Uptown campus, about which I know much less, to be honest. But there was always, there were reasons for it to be uh, less, in, less involved or less developed, a kind of student movement than at Columbia. It's also the case that some places get identified easily. And Columbia was an Ivy League institution. When there was a protest there, it was going to be picked up by the, by the press much more quickly than it would be if it were some other place. And it was a major, that was also happened to be a very major demonstration that, that was held that year, that time at Columbia. Anybody else? Yes. How did the press react to these riots? To what? 
uh, to the riots and demonstrations and movements? Well, the press doesn't speak with one voice, of course. Um, if you were to ask the Amsterdam News or, you know, uh, or to read something like uh, the New Republic or the Nation, you would get one. You might get one set of opinions. The New York Times is not the same as the the Post or the Daily News. So the Post and the Daily News were quite much more conservative at that time. The, the New York Times was more traditional. It reflected elite positions, but tended to be a kind of elite liberal and more liberal newspaper. Uh, they were sympathetic increasingly as the 60s went on to the, to the problems of the war and the problems of civil rights, um, but not necessarily to, they were, and they were reasonably sympathetic to things called marches on Washington, that's to say things that they saw as civil disobedience. Um, but they were not obviously sympathetic to things that, were, that then become riotous, though they were very much aware that increasingly, as you'll see, uh, the police become increasingly visible actors and, pro and, and antagonists in these stories. So it changes in the, in the early, in the late 60, from 68 to 72, the press changes a bit. And we'll, as anti-war movement changed, as you'll see. Anybody else? Okay. So let's move on with this story, if we may. But by one of the ways in which this story changes is to understand that the movement itself changes from the early 60s to the later 60s. There had been civil rights protests largely in the South, for instance, in 58, 59, 60. And it changes. And it had been a fairly integrated movement of blacks and whites together. By 1963, black power emerges in which African Americans create autonomous institutions in which they argue that they have, they have to play a role of leadership and that they don't want to be, as they feel, co-opted by, by, by white members. In 1964, New York, there's a heat wave in July, and a policeman kills a black boy. And it led to, leads to four days of riots. And rioting occurs in many American cities. New York is one of those cities. And increasingly, there's an awareness in that rioting that the black community has developed a new sense of militance, a new sense that it has long-standing grievances that legitimize for them going out on the streets in some way. So they know that what they're doing is illegal, but they obviously feel there's some legitimacy to what they think to, to illegal action going out. What's the context for this new kind of thinking? Well, in part, it came from the development of interest in community power. community control, and it becomes a kind of battle cry for the next years. The origins of community power and community empowerment, community control, go back to the writings of a man named Saul Alinsky, A-L-I-N-S-K-Y. And any of you who take courses in, on, in issues of community will know about Alinsky. He comes from Chicago, and he's generally thought to be the founder of community organizing in America. When one talks about Barack Obama having been a community organizer in Chicago, he is being schooled in the politics for which the manual is the work of Saul Alinsky. Okay? That's what we're talking about. <coughs> it was a policy, it was a program of politically proactively organizing communities to act locally in common self-interest. And in New York, it will be transferred to Brooklyn communities, Queens communities, Bronx communities, Manhattan communities, operating and organizing themselves as community groups for their own self-interest. Whether it's Forest Hills, or Bedford-Stuyvesant, or Brownsville, or Harlem. He organized the Chicago working class around the stockyards in the, 19th, in the 30s. But what he did was create what he called a radical model of organizing. That's to say he was critical of liberalism, which he saw as passive and ineffective. And he establishes and articulates a model which strives for something he calls social justice. That's to say it presumes that the issue of equality is not just a political issue, it is a social issue. It is an economic issue, not just a political issue. What is it, the radical model of what? Social justice. 
and that the intermediate goal for this is something he would call democracy. Grassroots political organizing to gain power in local institutions. By gaining a foothold, by gaining, by creating a democratic mass base within those institutions and then taking them over by dint of the vote. By making them your own institutions, not the institutions controlled by outsiders, liberal do-gooders, but your own institution controlled by yourself as you understand your needs. He argued effectively that the poor have little, the, that the main power that the poor has is their collective power. They don't have economic power. They can't, they can't go into a store and say, we're going to boycott you with, our, with, the no, with, the, with, the, with the no money that we don't have. Okay? That instead, they have to mobilize, among others, middle class supporters and themselves and they have to do it by taking over institutions. They have to among other things fight stock, fight, get stockholders to fight corporations by giving them proxies. So they have a whole range of different strategies. Some are, uh, are, are shareholder fights and some are local fights within communities. He writes a book in 1946 called Reveille for Radicals and it's published in 1971 as Rules for Radicals, a pragmatic primer for what he calls realistic radicals. So it's meant to be a political set of strategies. It's not meant to be something that they imagine is based on some pie-in-the-sky vision of a socialist utopia elsewhere in the world. It's meant to be based on what can you practically do within local communities to give the local people in that community control over their own lives. Here in that, the echo of the struggle on parietals, to get the local community control over their own lives, to give you, in theory, control over your own lives. In campus after campus, for instance, radicals do analyses of the board of trustees of a university and describe them as and find that they are interlocking directorates made up of all the major corporations. They sit on each other's boards. They decide how to invest in each other. That, in fact, the students, the faculty themselves have no control. They publish articles with provocative titles like, from an SDS pamphlet called Students as Niggers, meant to be deliberately provocative to suggest the ways in which students are, in fact, degraded and treated as slaves in institutions over which they have no control. So Olinsky is suggesting on a community basis a parallel to what was going on within schools, within universities, and what they're arguing ought to go on in social policy around war and around civil rights. That the people have to speak up. In New York City, his strategy informs many of the old left radicals who organized the, tent the tenant rent strikes in the 30s we've talked about and would continue to organize tenant rent strikes into the 50s and 60s. They would be instrumental in organizing trade unions with these kind of tactics. And they would win the support of liberals appalled by poverty, the degradation of the city, they would be appalled by Moses' version of a top-down slum clearance, which came to be known as urban removal, not urban renewal, in their, in their hands. And so in Greenwich Village, it becomes Jane Jacobs organizing the local Greenwich Village community to stop Fifth Avenue from being an arterial that go destroys the park and goes right through the city. Okay. So it becomes a major kind of grassroots movement against this top-down vision of the city. They organize in New York a citizens union, a citizens housing and planning council, and it leads New York planners, most especially a man by the name, name of Walter Thabit, T-H-A-B-I-T, to develop something he calls advocacy planning which would lead to the creation of community boards in New York City. He advocates effectively for community districts, 
and his plan is adopted in Manhattan as early as 1951, just in Manhattan, with 12 community planning councils to advise the mayor. But it's a radical notion, the idea that the community ought to have a say in advising these top-down leaders what's good for our community. It was just to be advisory, didn't remake the world. The plan is revised in 1961 to infect the entire city with 62 community planning boards. Today there are 59 of these boards. Roughly 250,000 people per district. But the legacy of the community boards that many of you would know about today come out of this movement in the 50s and the early 60s. They have no power. They have no absolute authority. They have leverage. Okay? They have kind of political capital rather than political power. They have a say in land use. And they will come to inform by the late 60s a powerful movement that will transform the politics of the city. A movement known as community control. Or community control. The origins of community control, however, are not ironically in this democratic radical group, but actually in one of the centers of American elite power the Ford Foundation in New York City. The Ford Foundation was no longer in the hands of Ford. Ford simply had to hand over his money and he was required for the tax gains that he made to hand it over to an independent group of people who ironically could do things that Ford had no interest in doing at all. Ford, as you may have known, may, may know, had become uh, later in his life was a terrible anti-Semitic and, and, uh, and quite a reactionary person. Okay? Uh, a bit of a, a, bit of a uh, Nazi, support, Nazi supporter. But the Ford Foundation was hardly that. It is an independent foundation that could experiment with social policy. It in fact, and it's true of many of these foundations, they <laughs> occupy a liminal middle ground that is not beholden to the private sector and not the public sector. And they have been able to often be quite experimental in the kinds of things that they could do. And in 1957, they fund something called Mobilization for Youth. And they fund it in the Lower East Side. They fund two people, two Columbia sociologists, one by the name of Francis Fox Piven and one by the name of Richard Cloward. Both are very famous even today. Piven is still alive, Cloward has since died. And they helped develop something called a Poor People's Movement in 1965. And it comes out of the Ford Foundation's mobilization for youth. It is centered in New York City and it becomes an alliance with the Welfare Rights Organization to form something called the National Welfare Rights Organization. A Poor People's Movement centered in New York to reclaim benefits that people felt they had been denied by the backlash politics of the 50s that had been entirely dependent on finding, by, by people losing benefits by claiming that they were lazy or that they were really just hiring men under their beds. And so it leads, in fact, to a movement to claim rights and a vast expansion of welfare benefits in city after city in the United States. It's actually, again, led by a local member, not Fibbon and Cloward, but George Wiley is his name, W-I-L-E-Y in New York. Membership grows to 25,000, and they demand, in their own words, adequate income, <coughs> dignity, justice, and democratic participation. And they do so with mass rallies, with demonstrations, and by going to office after office, having Poor people go there armed with knowledge as to what their rights are to claim benefits. The numbers seeking relief climb dramatically. AFDC, Aid to Families and Dependent Children, AFDC, rails increase 100,000 nationwide in the 50s. They increase 800,000 in the 60s, 170%. Now they're increasing in the 50s, but they're decreasing as an absolute number relative to the percentage of the population. Okay? 
So the point is that while there's a relative decline in the share of the po poor population getting them, they vastly increase. There is what comes to be known and feared by conservatives and increasingly by middle Americans who say I'm not getting those benefits is something called a welfare, and the metaphor is ex important, a metaphor explosion. The ways in which immigrants are often described as being a flood. Okay? It's the ways in which language is used already to color how the process was understood. Manhattan rolls quadruple during the 60s. And almost a quarter of that benefit, three quarters of that benefit of that increase is just in the years from 1964 after black power to 1968. So with this new kind of consciousness, expansion of awareness, a politics, new sense of entitlements, a new sense of justice. The rate goes up all across the country. The protest leads to more sympathy for clients, to be sure. Piven and Cloward argue that it also leads, that it's also a result of the political agitation. That's to say, it, it at least demonstrates to political radicals that agitation has cash value. It pays off. It can win. It can have political effects. It can have real material effects. That it's worth doing. And indeed, they engage in strikes that lead to a whole reorganized social worker left-wing unions. Remember I told you the left wing was ex exiled to Siberia, uh, not Siberia, to Siberia, that was in the suburbs. Siberia, which meant Coney Island, it meant Brooklyn. But those leaders, including a man named Sam Podell, again a Jewish social worker, come back and they reorganize a radical new left, augmented new left social worker unions in New York City who lead strikes in New York City of social workers in 1964 and in 1965. What's interesting about these particular strikes is that they're fought on behalf, not simply of themselves as social workers, but they fight on behalf of their clients. They demand better wages for themselves, yes, but they argue that equally important is more benefits for people who have been deprived. It is not just self-interest. And that they fight on behalf of unskilled caseworkers who are being created by welfare departments to simply become administrators of welfare rather than caseworkers. The response to these strikes, Wagner imposes the Wadlin Codlin Act. You may recall this. This was the anti, this was legislation opposing any strikes by public employees. He fires 5,000 of the social workers and jails 19 of their leaders. He would do the same thing a few years later when there's a transit strike. 28 days later, Wagner, the strike does not end. Wagner is forced to agree to a fact-finding com commission or committee that finds, in fact, for the union and the provisions of Codlin and Wadlin are thrown out. So as I suggested earlier that the legacy of the Cold War was often the passage of legislation that's anti-union, that, that tries to prevent strikes. It has, because New York City is a union town, some real effect. It destroys the CIO unions. But they're never able to put teeth in any of this anti-labor legislation against the public unions. The rise of black militants, the rise, the riots in the cities, the specter of unemployment strikes, the assassination of Malcolm X, followed by those of King and Kennedy, creates a growing sense of alarm. Not just within the African American community and anti-war communities, that their police are at the door, as you saw in that film, that we have to be suspicious about who's walking in. But it creates equally heightened sense of alarm in white communities that are are not identifying with the African-American community, but white communities that are concerned that these African-Americans may now want their jobs in construction, that now may want their jobs on the police force, that may want their jobs on the fire, in the fire brigades. Jobs that had been a source of their higher standard of living and the one source, the most important source 
for them. Often the ability to get their jobs for children would be threatened by these new demands for justice and oppor equal opportunity by African Americans. Control over jobs becomes as important as community control. Complicating this antagonism would be the fact that the sons of the police, the sons of the firemen, the sons of the construction workers are precisely those blue collar workers who fought for patriotism and who were being drafted to fight in Vietnam and whose sons were, being fight, were fighting in Vietnam and whose neighbors were fighting in Vietnam and now find themselves arrayed against students who are A, being exempted, not going to fight for those wars and are standing up and opposing the wars and in their minds jeopardizing the security of the fighting men abroad. And secondly, it's complicated by the rise of women's rights and gay rights, not just black power, which make the challenges as much a cultural war as a fight for jobs. This cultural war and fight for jobs will be expressed in three major conflicts that will erupt between 68 and 72 around hard hats and rulers, subject for Wednesday's, uh, Monday's lecture. Here, by the way, just a second, are the other photos. Photos of heroic construction workers, the Marlboro Man. Again, these images of masculinity in those occupations, trades. The papers, you're in Michelle's class over here, my class over here. Yeah.